Hi, all. We're finally getting to part two of Dying to be Made, our episode from season one about Joe Barboza's early days. In an effort to keep our episodes around 30 minutes each, we'll be covering January of 1968 to March of 1971 today. And next week, we'll pick up from the Clay Wilson murder trial to the hit on Barboza in 1976. Barboza and his many aliases, Baron, Bentley, and Donati, just to name a few, but for the sake of clarity, we will still call him Barboza throughout this episode. Ah, uh, Baron, don't worry, I won't get into the whole circumcision story again when Joe converted in order to marry the love of his life, and how he chose Baron as a surname, I still don't quite understand. Also next week, we'll finally be covering Joseph J.R. Russo. It's about time. <laughs> yes, it is. Anyhow, when we left you in episode 24 last season, Barboza's attorney, John Fitzgerald, was critically wounded when a bomb that was planted in Barboza's car exploded. The bomb was believed to be a way to scare Barboza into not testifying against the New England Mafia. And we know how well that worked out, but I still doubt who and why the attempt was made on Fitzgerald's life, but we're moving on from all of that. Thank goodness. Today we're going to pick up from the car bombing with some flashbacks along the way. Our regular listeners will probably know this date by heart by now, but for our listeners, for our new listeners, the Fitzgerald car bombing took place on January 30th, 1968. Don't worry, we're not going to rehash that here. You can hear more about that in Finding Frankie. Barboza was moved by the U.S. Marshals from Thatcher Island to a secret location nearby immediately after the attempt on Fitzgerald, but I think we should just briefly mention what was happening while Barboza was in protective custody and then move on. Go for it, but keep it short. Oh, you're just cranky because I reminded you that the uncle of Indian Alan, Indian Joe, not Arangeli, was your aunt's brother-in-law. <laughs> well, technically my aunt's husband's brother-in-law, but I don't mind that family connection. It's Vinnie Teresa's 10 degrees of separation, on the other hand, that I can't take. Well, you're actually connected to Vinny on your mom's side, too. <laughs> oh, how charming. One more connection for everyone that does tie into Barboza. Supposedly, Barboza had tried to kill Indian Alan Arangeli in 1965, but failed. So, Johnny Moderano wasn't the only one who failed to kill Al. Okay, now let's get back to Joe's timeline. Throughout the first part of 1968, the authorities would regularly visit Barboza in Gloucester, where he was being held in protective custody by the U.S. Marshals. Countless hours of debriefings took place where Barboza was essentially coached on what he would say on the stand during the upcoming Deegan trial. Visitors included U.S. attorneys Walter Barnes and Ted Harrington and the ADA Jack Zalkin. And of course, special agents Rico and Condon visited weekly to check in on Joe and to make sure he was comfortable. In March of 68, the verdict in the Willie Maffeo murder trial was handed down. Patriarca, Tamilio, and Casessa were found guilty thanks to Barboza's less than truthful testimony. For more on that story, listen to episode 42 of last season as the coinomatic turns. The government was elated over their victory, and when asked how the outcome of the case would affect the government's battle against organized crime, U.S. Attorney Markham replied, to put it in a negative way, if we didn't win it, it would all be over. What was that even supposed to mean? Mellow, dramatic, mumbo, jumbo. And speaking of mellow drama, when Markham and his team still hadn't visited Barboza 10 days after the verdict, Barboza had a tantrum. Rico and Condon tried to make excuses for them, saying that Markham was in D.C. on matters related to Barboza's situation. Barboza snapped, while these people don't want to show their appreciation, I'm sure that Joe Bolero, the chief attorney for the defense, would show his appreciation in me. And I'm sure that if things don't work out, that I can end up with at least 150 grand from Bolero. The man was being paid for his testimony by the government and wanted to shake them down for more. <laughs> he was being paid for his performance. Well, you know. In May of 68, Fitzgerald turned over a letter to the feds that Barboza had written to Senator Bobby Kennedy. In it, Barboza complained about his treatment while in federal custody. According to Fitzgerald, the text was essentially the same as a previous complaint that Barboza had written to the attorney general. It doesn't sound like either message was sent to the intended recipients. Fitzgerald told Rico and Condon that it was his opinion that Barboza just liked to complain and nothing was ever good enough for him. Just more melodrama. The man was unstable and they put him on the stand. 
Mm-hmm. And the jurors and Congress believed him. The Teddy Deegan murder trial began at the end of the month. We dedicated three episodes last season to Teddy's murder, the 1968 trial, and the convictions of the men accused by Joe Barboza of participating in the homicide. And don't forget, framed by the feds. That's the sickening part. Truly. But if you missed those episodes, the links are in the show notes, or you can find our episode catalog on our website. After the Deegan murder trial, Barboza was moved to Fort Knox in August of 1968. He remained there until April of 1969 when he was moved to Santa Rosa. During Barboza's time at Fort Knox, future FBI Special Agent John Morris was an MP who would frequently accompany Barboza while he walked his German Shepherd. Oh, that's sweet. Mm. On October 4th, the Department of Justice requested that Special Agents Rico and Condon interview Barboza again. Quote, Department advises that Barboza has indicated having additional information to discuss with Boston agents Condon and Rico, who developed his cooperative attitude, unquote. Just three days later, Hoover gave his blessing to the duo to visit Barboza. While the old guard was busy tending to Barboza, House Speaker John W. McCormick was writing a second letter of reference for John J. Connolly. He had already intervened on Connolly's behalf in August when it looked like the FBI was going to reject his application. On October 7th, McCormick sent another letter to J. Edgar Hoover recommending Connolly for Hoover's favorable consideration. The following day, Hoover replied, I am indeed pleased to inform you that Mr. John J. Connolly Jr., in whom you have expressed an interest, has been tendered an appointment as a special agent of the FBI. And just two days later, the Boston Sack sent a memo to Hoover noting that Special Agent Dennis Condon had known Connolly for one year and recommended him favorably for the position of special agent. On November 1, 1968, Barboza appeared in Suffolk County Superior Court in front of Judge Felix Forty. His attorney, John Fitzgerald, by then fitted with the prosthetic leg, was by his side. Barboza pleaded guilty to the charge of conspiracy to murder Teddy Deegan. He was charged with being a habitual criminal and sentenced to one year for the conspiracy charge. Judge Forty dismissed the charges against Barboza for the knifing of Arthur Pearson in 1966. Conveniently, Pearson had been stabbed to death in the North End less than a month before Barboza's sentencing. Barboza was technically still serving his four to five years for illegal weapons possession. The latest conviction was set to run concurrent with that 1967 sentence so that Barboza was set to be released in September the following year. Forty did not dismiss the habitual criminal charge, and ADA Zalgin told the press that Barboza could be sentenced to up to 28 years in prison on that charge at any time. What a bunch of BS. They weren't sending Barboza to prison. And speaking of BS, on New Year's Day, Frank Bolero was killed in what was believed to be a drunk driving accident. Later, when Barboza was giving one of his interviews, he claimed responsibility for Frankie's death. But Barboza was still locked up at that time. Now, that doesn't mean he didn't ask someone on the street to run him off the road, but he certainly didn't do it himself. None of them were above claiming hits that weren't actually hits or weren't theirs. Well, lies is part of the title of this podcast. Well. As for Forty's bogus, harsh words, you would have to imagine public opinion was not in favor of the deal the government had cut with Barboza. He was sent back to Fort Knox to serve his so-called sentence. On January 24, 1969, a letter from the Assistant Attorney General was sent to Hoover about Barboza's pending release. Quote, we feel we have the responsibility to relocate this witness and his family. Accordingly, we have made some preliminary inquiries and determined that it may be possible to send Barboza to Australia. Well, it was a former penal colony. Well, it just goes to show you that the feds didn't give much thought beforehand about what to do with their prized witness. On January 28th, Hoover replied that the FBI had no objections to relocating Barboza since, quote, the FBI investigations stemming from information furnished by Barboza have been completed, unquote. But he was not off to Australia. Well, we'll get to where he went in a second. But like magic, Jimmy Flemmy was released from Walpole on March 28th, and the following day, Barboza was freed after a special meeting of the parole board of the Charles Street Jail. 
on the condition that he leave the state of Massachusetts and never return. Judge Forte had suspended Barboza's sentence in the Deegan case earlier that day, and Barboza was put back on a plane and returned to Fort Knox. Roughly two weeks later, he was moved to Santa Rosa, California. Word spread quickly that Barboza was heading for his new digs. A prisoner at the Barnstable County Jail wrote an anonymous letter to the warden who reported to the FBI that there had been a security leak in the transfer of Barboza and certain people knew the details. It was also reported that people from Providence were tasked with tracking him down. The following month, Special Agent Condon relayed in a memo to Hoover that he desired to make Barboza a top echelon informant, and Hoover agreed. I have to relay this next bit of info without sounding too facetious. Oh, good luck with that. In August, after graduating from the Maritime Union's Cooks and Stewards School, Barboza was sent off on a ship to Asia. Not quite Australia, but at least in the same ocean. Wait, wait. FBI Special Agent Chuck Heiner out of the San Francisco field office later said the cooking school was a, quote, den of thieves, unquote. I wonder who some of Barboza's classmates were. Well, actually, one of them recognized him from back home. (laughs) He stuck out like a sore thumb. How the hell could the feds think he would go unnoticed? The face, the build, the voice, the mannerisms. I'm still trying to figure out how they hid Vinnie Teresa all those years. At least they had an easier time tucking Jack away, just another cranky old Irishman. Later on, Barbosa wanted the government to play, pay for plastic surgery. He was perfectly aware of the problem. At least someone was. Anyway, at some point, Barbosa supposedly injured his back and landed in a hospital in Hong Kong. He was eventually flown back to the States to recuperate at a naval hospital in San Francisco. Barbosa later said he was confined to a body casket. At first, eventually needing a cane to walk, I assume he meant body cast. The best part of the story is that Barboza put in a workers' comp claim and received an $18,000 settlement. Barboza later wrote to a friend, I hurt my back in Kowloon and collected $18,500. Strange how well my back feels now, unquote. He faked the injury to get back home to the United States. And make a little money. Well... A lot of money. That was like two years worth of income Mm -hmm. on a a middle class. Anyway, after Barboza's failed chef endeavor, he needed a new income stream. Enter Jim Southwood, Barboza's journalist pen pal from his earlier stint in jail. In October of 1969, attorney Fitzgerald returned to Boston to testify in front of the grand jury in his car bombing case. While he was there, he met up with Southwood to negotiate the pending book deal between him and Barboza. But instead, Southwood gave him an envelope with some transcripts from an earlier interview Fitzgerald had done with him and left Fitzgerald to figure out on his own that Jim wanted to back out of the agreement. Fitzgerald told Barboza what had happened, and Barboza said that he needed to get back to Boston to convince Southwood to change his mind. I have this vision of Barboza holding Southwood hostage in a dingy motel room with a typewriter. Or maybe they just smoked dope together like Barboza later claimed. Well, as we mentioned in in Jack's Justice Part 3 of this season, Bernard Zena was shot four times in the head on December 21st, 1969. The killer had shot once through the driver's window, then opened the door and shot Zena three more times. It was the second attempt on his life in less than a year. Barboza had previously testified against Zena, Jerry Angiulo, and two others for the murder of Rocco de Siglio, a murder he was guilty of himself. Barboza would later claim responsibility for Zena's slaying. Now, Barboza wasn't supposed to be anywhere near Massachusetts, but Southwood wanted to have Barboza and Fitzgerald appear on Channel 5 to be interviewed about the gang war. Barboza pleaded with Fitzgerald to make the appearance with him. He was broke, about to be evicted, and tired of working as a cook. But the interview couldn't take place in Massachusetts, so he suggested Rhode Island. Think about choosing that location. In the middle of January 1970, Barboza was nagging Fitzgerald again. Southwood had promised him $2,000 for the interview, and he was desperate for the money. Barboza also told Fitzgerald that he had 50 pages of material that would overturn the three cases. Deegan and the Willie Maffeo, Maffeo murder cases included, without any risk of him being charged with perjury. 
By the end of the month, Barboza was desperate and back on the phone with Fitzgerald, this time not only for his agreement to appear on Channel 5, but to borrow $120, $120 that he promised to pay back after he shook down Southwood, who had guaranteed him $3,000 for the TV appearance. Note that the promised payment had increased from two grand to three. Fitzgerald and Southward weren't the only two who knew Barboza was back in town. On February 3rd, Special Agent Rico advised Barboza that the LCN was aware that he was in the area. Rico also told him that two individuals were hired to do a hit on an unknown individual who was possibly him. Rico warned him to leave immediately and return to California. Special Agent Condon later testified that in about the same time frame, he had received information that two hitmen from Boston, Harry Johnson and Alan Fiddler, had been wandering around Northern California looking for Barboza. The locals stopped Johnson and Fiddler in the area where Barboza had been living and realized that not only were they armed, but they were also using aliases. The cops ordered them to leave town. The police contacted the FBI Boston field office and Condon supposedly relayed the info to Barboza. But Barboza wasn't in California. He was right in Johnson and Fiddler's backyard. Well, that part was supposed to be a secret. Note that neither Rico nor Condon were concerned that Barboza was violating his parole by returning to Massachusetts. At last, on February 6th, 1970, Barboza, Fitzgerald, and Southwood met at the Holiday Inn in Randolph to do their TV interview. Barboza had his brothers and two other unnamed men with him. It took a total of five hours to film the interview. I just want to note here that Louis the Fox Taglianetti was shot to death in Cranston, Rhode Island, just six hours after the interview ended. Anything is possible, but I don't see the motive. But years later, Fitzgerald testified that when he arrived at the motel the next day to continue the interview, he saw a gun in Joe's attache case. Well, the timing and location fit. Fitzgerald also claimed later that Joe had told him that he had been approached to, quote, straighten things out. But he also stated that Joe said that the feds had told him that Jerry and Julo had ordered the hit. The point is that they were all liars, so we'll never really know for sure. I still don't understand how he was allowed to roam around Massachusetts considering how many people he put in the can. Forget that, how they allowed him to run amok for so long to begin with. Greed, I assume. And the feds were trying to protect their reputations and careers by allowing him so much leeway. Throughout the month of February, Fitzgerald continued to meet with Barboza's wannabe biographer, Southwood, including to receive the money that Joe had borrowed from Fitzgerald. I think Southwood was still trying to extricate himself from the situation, and Barboza was busy calling Fitzgerald and Rico about missing persons, buried bodies, and people writing disparaging comments about him. <laughs> Barboza may have been physically tough, but mentally and emotionally, he was a crybaby, constantly feeling slighted and offended. While he was getting his feelings hurt, newly minted special agent John J. Connolly was placed in the San Francisco field office. And the feds were busy heaping praise upon each other for their cultivation of Barboza. On March 31st, 1970, a memo was sent from J.H. Gale to Deloge, quote, Special a Agent Rico's development of Boston mobster Joe Barboza, a vicious killer and organized crime figure in his own right, set off a chain of events which have seen the surfacing of a number of additional racket figures in New England as cooperative witnesses during the past few years. Making use of the compromising information he had received from other top echelon informants he had previously turned, Rico brought Barboza to the point where he testified against Patriarca and two of his elders. LCN subordinates, unquote. I cannot believe you made me read that. It's better you than me. J. Edgar Hoover responded directly to Rico. It is obvious that you have not only fulfilled your duties with a high degree of professional skill, but have approached your assignments with a dedication that truly serves as an inspiration to your associates. I want you to know how much I appreciate your valuable contributions to our work, which have enabled us to fulfill our vitally important obligations. Okay, that was worse, and his associates hated him. We all know that. <laughs> well, no. In the meantime, Barboza was still roaming around his old haunts and not quietly. In April of 70, Barboza popped up on the New Bedford chief of police's radar. 
Chief Gifford Durfee brought Barboza in for an interview, and Joe didn't take too kindly to it. He called Fitzgerald to complain about Durfee and the treatment his brother was receiving in jail. Durfee was killed in an automobile accident on May 26th. William Garraway would later allege that Barboza caused the crash and Durfee's death, and in this case, Barboza was more than likely guilty. The part that pisses me off the most was that Rico was fully aware that Barboza was on the prowl. Years later, he would testify at the Clay Wilson murder trial, at least as of April 1970, that he was in communication with Barboza. Face-to-face communication. They met in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. But speaking of Rico, he had a going-away party at Anthony's Pier 4 that same month and was transferred to the Miami field office the following month. Spare us the blow-by-blow of that, please. But the event got a little write-up in the Boston Globe. I have to quote from the article. Quote, the names Rico and Condon were a watchword and went together like ham and eggs or bread and butter. They're going to be ill. And with that, the dynamic duo was split up. But Rico's dream of moving to Miami was finally realized, mostly thanks to Richie and with a little help from Robert Dadiecko and Ronnie Chisholm. In the meantime, the neighborhood was getting a little crowded with the return of Stevie Flemmy in May. Fitzgerald was upset after hearing from Southwood that Stevie was back in town now that Sonny Shields had been acquitted and immediately called Special Agent Condon. How come you haven't picked up Flemmy, he asked. Dennis replied, what do you mean? Well, Southwood told me he called you and told you that Flemmy was back in Boston. I never talked to him, Denny claimed. Well, it wasn't like Condon could tell him that Stevie was a top echelon informant. Well, he was Denny Condon's golden boy. (laughs) A few days later, Barboza phoned Fitzgerald and told him that he had spoken with Rico and Condon and told him that Southwood went to see Jerry and Julo because he was guilt-stricken about the fact that Barboza had lied in the Deegan trial. But when Fitzgerald confronted Southwood, he denied ever speaking to Angelo. By June, more than the temperature was heating up. Barboza was convinced that someone had made him and that Guy Frizee was in California. I believe I've questioned this in a previous episode, but I thought Guy and Connie for Z were allies of Barboza. Well, I thought so too, but there is a 302 from 1966 that says that Barboza split with Connie for Z and hooked up with Tash Bratzos, and maybe that story was true. Either way, Special Agent Condon contacted Barboza to tell him that his life was in danger, but I want to know if Dennis thought that this was helpful, because in my mind, all he was doing was encouraging Barboza's paranoia and adding fuel to the fire. The following month, the inevitable happened. Barboza murdered Clay Wilson around July 5th outside of Santa Rosa, California. A few days later, the Wilson home in Glen Ellen burnt to the ground. The newspaper reported, quote, firemen were unable to save the home, nor were they able to find the owners, Mr. and Mrs. Clay Wilson. Barboza was back in Massachusetts just two days after the fire, this time meeting with F. Lee Bailey at Larry Hughes' home. Bailey allegedly gave Barboza an envelope with $800 in it that an anonymous person dropped at Bailey's office. And it wasn't just Bailey that Barboza was visiting. On July 17th, he was arrested in New Bedford with a man named Herbert Jesus, who the authorities said was Joe's cousin. The two men had tried to drive another car off the road and started waving their guns and threatening the occupants of the other car. Joe had a fully loaded 25 and Herbie a 38. The cops also found a loaded M1 rifle on the front seat and a baggie of marijuana. And with that absolutely moronic move, Barboza's parole was violated. He was shipped off to the Bristol County House of Corrections and held on $100,000. Barboza's 16 months of freedom came to an abrupt halt. Well, my favorite part was that Barboza told the locals that he was back in Massachusetts helping the feds with a case. The FBI promptly denied it, but they still came to Barboza's rescue. On July 20th, all of the charges were dropped and both he and Herbie were free to go. The authorities said that Barboza had no legal representation at his arraignment and therefore his rights were violated. 
While he wasn't free for long, the next day he was picked up and shipped to Walpole, where he was supposed to remain until October 5th. Upon hearing about Barboza's new home, Hoover wrote to the attorney general to have him moved as the feds believed his life was in danger because of the other inmates. And this is when Barboza tried to do the right thing. Ted Harrington met with ADA Zalkin and Garrett Byrne to discuss the affidavit that Bailey prepared for Barboza. Harrington contacted Dennis Condon and assured him that the document was not sufficient to warrant a new trial in the Deegan murder case. Burns said he'd confer with Judge Felix Forte and request that the motion for a new trial be denied. Jerome Sullivan ran an article on July 29th titled Barboza Admits Perjury. Attorney Joe Bolero filed a motion for a new trial on Henry Tamilio's behalf based on Barboza's statement that he had perjured himself. That same day, Raymond Patriaga's attorneys were filing a motion for a new trial for his conviction on conspiracy charges in the William Maffeo murder case. Barboza wanted to change his plea, but as Laura just mentioned, the fix was in and Barboza's statement wouldn't be accepted. And the wrongfully convicted men would continue to languish in prison. The feds were just as responsible, if not more so, than Barboza for their predicament. Sickening, completely disgusting, all to protect their own reputations and careers. That same week, Barboza's cousin, Herbie, went to Southwood's home and took all of the materials and notes for the Barboza bio that was never to be. While he was there, Southwood told Herbie that Barboza had rented a car in Southwood's name and stiffed the car rental company for the payment. The bill was so high that the creditors had turned off his electricity. Herbie delivered the materials to Bailey's office. While Bailey was trying to placate Barboza, Barboza was running, busy running his mouth with his cellmate, William Garraway. They were bunk buddies from August until September 25th of 1970. According to Garraway's later statements, Joe confessed that he killed Clay Wilson back in California. Garraway might be familiar to some of our listeners. He was in prison for the 1967 murder of David Sidlowskis. We briefly discussed Sidlowskis in episode 27 last season. It's believed that Johnny Mutterano was actually responsible for Sidlowskis' death. Garraway had also been accused of murdering Tony Varanis, but his own closing statement was apparently so eloquent that the jury found him not guilty. Varanis was also Johnny Mutterano's handiwork. Nearly two decades later, Johnny would confess to the murder as part of his plea agreement with the authorities. Yeah, well, Garraway was already dead by then. Well. Garraway later claimed that Barboza had threatened his family, and that's why he turned him in. According to Garraway's version of events, he went to Ronnie Cassessa and told him, quote, this guy's gone, he's never getting out of prison, he's not hitting the street. Garraway continued, and Cassessa asked me what had happened, and I told him, and he said, well, he might get off and go his own way, and I said, no, he's not going his own way, because he's not getting out. I'm nailing him today. I'm sending for the DA today, and Cassessa said, well, let him get out of prison. If you don't, he'll be screaming. He'll be down on all of us, so I said, all right, he's got two days, and after he left, I turned him into the DA. Garraway turned Barboza in for the murder of Clay Wilson in California. He also claimed that Barboza told him that he had killed another person in California, but he couldn't furnish enough useful information to help the authorities find a body. On August 21st, Barboza had his parole violation hearing. Under direct questioning by F. Lee Bailey, Barron admitted visiting Massachusetts despite the terms of his parole on at least five occasions, but he claimed he did so under the FBI auspices on four of those five occasions. He said that on one occasion, he was asked by federal agents to work on a case involving the theft of a half a million dollar painting. What painting? There hadn't been any recent art thefts, but as the feds had mentioned before, Barboza was not in Massachusetts helping them with the case. The parole board sent Barboza back to Walpole, and with nothing but time on his hands, he took up his old hobby of letter writing again. One of the first recipients was Walter Barnes. Bailey wanted me to take a lie detector test on Monday, and I said no because of the fact that the guys on death row are taking it, which is today, and that I'm too upset to take one right now. And if I did later, it would prove affirmative that I was telling the truth. He called me a liar. And I said, who is the liar? You're the liar, Bailey. That's about it. Tell Denny Condon that I still love him. If Rico were here, he'd help me. I want to be with my wife and babies, please. 
On September 1st, Barboza received a 10-page letter from Bailey, and he couldn't wait to tell Garraway all about it. According to Garraway, the letter included the statement, innocent, mind, men, innocent men's lives have been destroyed by your testimony. Garraway further stated, Bailey pleaded with Barron to come forth once in his life and tell the truth just because it's right. Even the dog barked over that. And Bailey wasn't going to wait for Barboza to do the right thing. So the following day, he leaked his own memo he had sent to his colleague, Joe Bolero. The memo said that Barboza's statements would clear four of the men convicted of Teddy Deegan's murder. And that same day, Bailey filed a motion for leave to withdraw as Barboza's attorney. Barboza wrote to Ted Harrington on September 28th. When you and Walter came down to see me, you and Walter asked me not to do something, and I didn't. How long can the little money I bled out of those creeps last? What'll happen to my wife and babies then? Bailey said I'll come running to him in the end. I never will. That's all I want is that job, to be moved to a new location and new ID, and I'll be out of your hair and Walter's completely. I'll never complain again. I doubt anyone bought Barboza's false promises and crocodile tears. You know, part of me thinks Barboza actually believed his own lies. Well, any successful con man needs to believe his own bullshit. Indeed. In the beginning of October, the Santa Rosa police received letters from William Garraway and another Massachusetts inmate, Lawrence Wood, about Clay Wilson's murder. If you listened to episode eight last season, you might recall that Lawrence Wood was convicted along with Laura's dad, Richie, in the DeSisto home invasion. Interesting coincidence. The chief of police in Santa Rosa contacted the Boston FBI office, and of course, it was assigned to Dennis Condon to deal with them. But the law enforcement officers in Sonoma County were too efficient and quickly verified the information in Garraway and Woods' letters. On October 12th, Clay Wilson's body was discovered exactly where Garraway said it would be, and there are no coincidences. Exactly. The Sonoma County investigator traveled to Boston to find out more about Barboza and to interview Garraway. He met with Special Agent Condon to learn more about Barboza, but Condon gave him nothing more than he could have read in the newspapers. Massachusetts State Police were more helpful, in particular John Regan. The Sonoma County investigator said that he had a bad feeling about the FBI in this case and was baffled as to why another law enforcement agency would not assist his investigation. Should I be making a snarky comment now? Uh, there's no need for that. Well, old habits die hard, both for my bitchy commentary and the Fed's lack of willingness to cooperate with other law enforcement agencies. In fact, the investigator's gut feeling about the Feds led him to take special precautions to determine whether someone was tampering with the documents he had in his hotel room. He never figured out who was responsible, but years later he told the committee that he believed his briefcase was searched at a time when it was supposed to be securely locked in his room. After returning to California, the investigator met with the prosecution team to discuss the status of the investigation. The team decided that the investigator was to call Condon to request records on Barboza. Numerous calls were placed to Condon about the records request, but Condon never returned the calls or produced the records. Gee, what a surprise. <laughs> Shocking. On November 2nd, Lawrence Wood was interviewed about Barboza. Wood said that Barboza claimed the FBI promised him $20,000 but stiffed him. Hey, he told the Wood, Woods also, though, that the feds had supplied him with ample weed and booze while he was being held in Gloucester. Oh, come on. They were trying to keep their star witness happy. <laughs> Wood also told them the same information that Garraway had about the murder of Clay Wilson, adding that Barboza said he wanted to kill the two women he had recruited to help with Wilson's slaying. Wood stated that Barboza claimed to have killed two other people, but Barboza never named them. He also took credit for the auto accidents of Frank Valero and Gifford Durfee, but as we mentioned earlier, Barboza personally couldn't have killed Valero, but Durfee was likely his victim. While Barboza was busy confessing his sins to Woods, he also said that he had killed Carlton Eaton back in September of 1964. Eaton was stabbed and shot and could have just as likely been a victim of Jimmy Flemmy as Barboza. We'll never know the truth. Barboza also told Wood that he had killed six other unnamed individuals while he was in witness protection. As for Garraway, Barboza gave him details about the slayings of DeSazio and O'Neill on November 15, 1965. For more about them, listen to the Hit Parade of 1965. 
Barboza also told Garraway why he killed Wilson. Wilson had confided in Barboza that he had robbed a home of $250,000 worth of stocks, bonds, jewelry, and antiques. And that was all Barboza needed to hear. Garraway also shared details about Barboza's time at sea. According to the tale Barboza told Garraway, it appeared that he had little time for cooking, but plenty of time to get VD from a woman in the Philippines, rob a sailor in Hong Kong after knifing him, and try to kill another sailor along the way. Hey, at least Barboza was at ease. Finally, at the end of December, the California authorities issued an extradition order to the office of the governor of Massachusetts. Hoover was given a heads up by the Boston SAC that the extradition was pending. It took another six weeks before the governor signed the papers. Barboza's attorney scrambled to file motions to block the extradition, but Judge Smith denied them. On February 24th, Barboza arrived in Santa Rosa, California to face charges in the death of Clay Wilson. On March 1st, he entered a plea of not guilty. And that's where we're going to leave you today. Hate to leave you all hanging. I hope you listen again next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.